on the Kardak Radio Facebook page and on Kardak Radio itself on Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern. We come here every Sunday uh, talking about another aspect of Spiritism. And lately we've been on a series of talking about Alan Kardec's The Gospel According to Spiritism. And today we're talking about Chapter 19, Faith Moves Mountains. But before I begin, please hit the subscribe, hit the bell button, give us a like thumbs up and this helps spread spiritism to other people and helps you know it helps the algorithm the youtube algorithm to uh to give our our uh, video top billing when other people are interested in spirituality so please do that that would be wonderful if you could so now tonight i'm going to do something a little bit different i'm going to talk about what alan kardec says about face faith moves mountains but i'm also going to go through on even more information about it because there is a lot so let me let me start because this is uh, extremely exciting and interesting so we will go into faith moves mountains so this is chapter 19 and it starts with uh, matthew uh, chapter 17, verse 14 through 20. Let me read this for you. And when they come to the multitude, they are, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For of times he falleth into the fire and of times into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer for you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as grain as mustard seed, Ye shall say unto the mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now let's see what, what Alan Kordek had to write about this. This is what he says. In one sense, it is certain that confidence in one's own strength gives man the capacity to carry out material things, which he would not be able to do if he doubted himself. However, here we wish to deal exclusively with the moral sense of these words. The mountains which faith can transport are the difficulties, the resistance, the ill will, and in fact all those things which man has to face, even when we refer to good things. The prejudices, routines, materialistic interests, selfishness, the blindness of fanaticism, and the prideful passions are but few of the mountains which block the way of those who work for human progress. Robust faith gives perseverance, energy, and resources, which allows us to overcome these obstacles, be they large or small. From wavering faith results only uncertainty and the kind of hesitation which those adversaries we need to combat take advantage of. This faith does not even try to find the means to win because it does not believe it can. Another acceptance of the terms gives us to understand that faith is the confidence we have in the realization of something and the certainty of attaining a specific end. It gives us a kind of lucidness which permits us to see in thought the goal we wish to reach and the means of getting there so that those who have faith go forward in a manner of speaking with absolute security in either one of these cases, it can give place to the realization of great things. Faith, which is real and sincere, is always calm. It permits patience, which knows how to wait, because, because having faith as its foundation in intelligence and the understanding of life, it is certain of reaching the objective it aspires to. Vacillating faith fills its own weakness. When its interest is aroused, it becomes frenzied and thinks it can supply the force it lacks by using violence. Calmness during the struggle is always a sign of strength and confidence, whereas on the contrary, violence denotes weakness and self-doubt. 
it behooves us not to confuse faith with presumption. True faith is linked to humility. Those who have it deposit more confidence in God than in themselves, as they know they are but simple instruments of divine purpose and can do nothing without God. This is the reason why the good spirits come to their aid. Presumption is less faith than pride, and pride is always punished sooner or later by the deceptions and frustrations inflicted upon it. The power of faith can be demonstrated in a direct and special manner in magnetic action. Through the intermediary of faith, men act on fluids, which are a universal agent, modifying their qualities and giving them, in a manner of speaking, irresistible impulsion. From this, it follows that whoever joins a normally great fluidic power to that of ardent faith, slowly, solely by the strength of the real willpower directed toward goodness, operates those singular phenomena of healing and other occurrence known in olden times as miracles, but which are nothing more than consequences of a law of nature. This is the reason for Jesus saying to his apostles that if they did not, not, if they did not cure, it was because they had no faith. So let's... Let's think about that. So at the end, he's, he's, Kardec is talking about, well, it's kind of a, you know, it's your faith and it's, it's the power of your mind joined together with fluidic power. And he looks at that as healing people and, and you know, other, other things like that. As when Jesus said his disciples, when he couldn't cure, said they didn't have enough faith and therefore they didn't focus their willpower enough and with enough certainty that they could cast that devil out of that poor son of the man. So, but what I want to bring to you is, is something else. Faith can move mountains is something again, which is, I just love spiritism again, when Jesus said faith can move mountains and Alan Kardec just interpreted in a certain manner. Jesus also meant faith could move mountains, could create mountains, not here in our physical plane, right? Not here, but in the spirit world. Now, I had a person, um, I believe he's from Finland, write me and say, you know, I read one of your articles and it said, thought is action in the spirit world, but I don't see that anywhere in the spirit's book or other places by Alan Kardec. It's, you know, I think it's hinted at. But, and I think in Genesis, you'll see that there's more of that that actually will tell you that the, the, is the workings of the high spirits create what we have now. But you kind of have to read into that. It's a little indirect. But it's there. In my opinion, other people may have different opinions. But, again, this is part of and Alan Kardec didn't state it right out there. This is part of the reason when spiritism tells us they only give us information as we are ready to absorb it. Now, in the early 20th century, the Reverend G. Val Owen had communications with spirits that actually told him thought is action and they gave him examples. So why did they do it then? Well, because, well, 50, 60, 70 years later, the concept of, of, you know, of the computing power, of databases, of matrix, all those things started to become. And this, was, this, is, how, this is how the spirits, they lay these little seeds. And to us, it's like us when we have a year or five or 10 at most year horizon, like, what are they talking about, right? I'm sure people, a lot of these things in G. Valen's book, I'm sure people thought, well, this is crazy. And But when you interpret it by our modern standards of, oh yeah, there is, you know, all this data from our minds stored somewhere and, and high spirits can, can get this data from, they know exactly what we're thinking at whatever time in our lives. And it, it makes sense with the universal cloud. So this, you know, these are little seeds that are planted and that are planted, you know, that are told to us today, and we, and we have no clue, but we will. So, in let's talk about this. Faith moves mountains. And let me give you some examples. Let me give you the examples. Now, we've all heard that there are children in heaven. Now, these are, you know, some children who die, then 
that when they pass over, they transfer themselves back to the mature spirit they were. Other children, when they die, are given a chance to help remold and, and modify their character for the better by having a span of childhood in the spirit world. Now, in my book, and I talk about this in my book, if you want to learn more about the power of spirits. In my book, Spirit and the Spirit Universe, book two of Spiritism, the spirit world revealed to an Anglican vicar, I talk about how spirits learn about how to handle their different attributes. And so these children, and in the spirit, Arnell talks about this to the Reverend G. Val Owen. And Arnell described, let me go through what he described, let me get, the, get his the words correct here. Arnell described the campus as one with the surrounding environment. There were gardens, sculptures, fountains, and forests, all intermixed. Oops, there we go. And, is, and, is, and then there was various halls and buildings which comprised the grounds. And so outside one of the lecture halls was a garden, an enclosed area shaped into an oval by hedges and other plants. And in the middle stood a fountain circled by water and the grass seemed to float out from the fountain. And so in the vernacular of the time when Arnell was on earth, he called this a pleasant, right? A nice little area that it can be. Now this is how he describes what the children do. Now I want you to put his description and think well, how children play here to get them ready, right? When I was, you know, when you're ready and when you're a child, you know, and, and, and you know, we, if you have a swimming pool, you play Marco Polo. That way you would, you would exercise your ability to hear where sound came from. You know, people, you know, kids play sports. They do all sorts of things to, to prepare themselves for the real world. They make, they'll make little comic books or, or write books or, Right, little, you know, music may not be very good. Some of them could be very good, but I'm saying they do all these things in order for them to learn as they do things in later life. So this is Arnell describing what the children did in this area he called the Pleasance. I will quote, they gather in different parts of the Pleasance. One stands on top the fountain upon the ledge where the design ends and in a tree. He calls to one of his playmates, giving him a certain position upon the fountain. The one bespoken closes his eyes and then raises himself up by what you would call the process of levitation and floats to his position. So imagine this, there's a fountain and another one stands on a tree and he says, okay, you go to that ledge on the fountain. And he says, okay, so they, then the, they're all standing around the fountain and they have to rise themselves up, levitate, and you, you call it the and they call that levitation, but also a volatation. They call that in the books by Andre Louise, where people, they move by the speed of thought. So they already, these children are teaching themselves to, in their mind, to move from point A to point B. And this point is very close. So he says, one after another is called until they group everywhere in the proper station around the fountain, you know, on the fountain somewhere. Then another descends back to the ground and calls them back and they have to descend in like manner eyes closed on the exact spot whereupon they stood at the beginning of the game and i'm still quoting if you will follow such a game as this in your imagination and the mistakes it is possible to make you'll see how much fun these gay young people find in it so what are they teaching them they're teaching them to visualize where they want to go close their eyes, move where they want to go, and they're teaching them, okay, you better remember where you came from, because if you volatate with the power of your mind and you don't know where you came from, how are you going to get back? And then they have, you know, they close their eyes and they have to go back in the exact same stop, spot they were. Now, as I was saying before, you know, when I was young, we played a game called Marco Polo. It was played in a pool, whereupon one child would hide from others. Each child must close their eyes and yell, Marco, and the one chosen child with the eyes open would have to shout polo until one of the children found the one who had been constantly dodging the unseen swimmers. And it was a game designed to train oneself to determine the direction in which sound came from. The training is the same in the spirit world. 
but it is more than exercising the relationship between sound and direction. It is about establishing and strengthening the mind to place the body in the exact location desired. It is about the connection between thought and action. In heaven, one may walk, but also one may rise into the atmosphere, since your mind places your body where it wishes. Terra firma is a reference point, a point to begin. In the lower le levels, people walk, right? They're not used to that, but then they get trained and more and more. Spirits who have trained themselves don't have to only travel via, via foot. Other methods of physical transportation, they may move by thought, again called volatation, in spiritist literature. And remember this, the speed of light is not the ultimate limit of velocity in the spirit realm. In the book No Solar, dictated by the spirit Henri Luiz, to the great Brazilian medium Francisco Chico C. Xavier, Henri Luiz remembers a conversation he had with a friend in the spirit colony about volatation. Henri saw people walking in means of transportation called air buses, which would take people around the colony or back to the earth plane. But he knew of people who didn't require any such means of transport. They just went. His friend had the answer. This is what Henri Luis reports. Again, what I'm saying is I take this information from Chivao Owen and I put it here with information from Chico Xavier. I try to bring all the spiritualist literature and try to, you know, really research the point and tell what all that we can know. This is what. Uh, he, Henri was told, here in Nosolar, not all of us need an Airbus for transportation because the more elevated inhabitants of the colony have the power of volatation at their disposal. Nor do all of us need communication equipment to converse over long distances because we mutually maintain ourselves on a plane of perfect thought attunement. Those who are attuned in this way may use the process of mental conversation at will regardless of the distance. So, perfect thought attunement describes one of the lessons learned in aerial flight. Arnell went on to describe another game. So there's other games that I describe in my book, Spirits in the Spirit Universe. Now let's go through another example. And this is from G. Vau Owen's mother. So, G. Vau Owen's mother talked to Jiva Owen. She was in, in one of the lower levels of heaven. And it, this is one of the first parts of, of the book, Beyond the Veil. And she told him how she was being trained to use her mind. Again, you know, faith moves mountains. I'm just talking about little things. I'll get to bigger things in a minute. And she goes, yeah, we don't, you don't know here, but, you know, and she talked a little bit about what she called something different, but universal fluid, as is really explained in uh, the Spirits book and Genesis and, uh, you know, other books, a lot by Andre Luis's books and some of the other books, uh, Evolution in Two Worlds. But, and she says, yes, so we're being trained to use our mind. And goes, so what happens is a group of us got around this pedestal and we said, okay, all of you visualize a statue of an elephant. And they go, Okay, and you know, and they started making this elephant. And so imagine a group of 10 people all trying to make a statue of an elephant. Well, some people kind of made, it didn't look like a bronze. It was like real elephant. Someone kind of made a woolly mammoth because that's what they were thinking of. And it was all jumbled up. And, they, and she said, because you know, for you, those of you who think we don't laugh, we do. We all, we all laughed. And they said, okay. Try again and get together better. So they tried again, did a better job, right? And then they, they also went to a point where they saw these dials and things here. And, and when they thought they could see them moving and they go, well, what are these? And then finally, one of them figured out, well, oh, this must be the concentration of different densities and, and harmonies and variations of universal fluid. So as we think and we're influencing universal fluid, we have a feedback loop of how our thoughts are bringing universal fluid in to create the construct of what we are thinking of. So when I tell you these things, doesn't 
heaven sound like an advanced college? You know, it certainly doesn't sound like you're playing harp music or drinking daiquiris on the beach all day. It sounds like there's work. It sounds like there's a lot of fun work. And this is how it is. Heaven is something that if you're intellectually curious, of course, this is what the spirit world wants us, right? It wants us to be pure souls, kind and generous. But they also want us to be intellectually curious, want, you know, just being thirsting after new information. And this is why, again, the more you study spiritism, it's so exciting, the more you'll learn of what you're going to be capable of when you pass over. And the more we, what you see of what's there awaiting you, the more that this self-sacrifice of not doing things that go against your conscience becomes trivial. Like, oh, yeah, I can survive all this money and try to be an honorable person and not have the newest car or the newest whatever because the reward is so much greater. And that's why over and over you'll read in the spiritualist literature that whatever sacrifices you make here on earth in a physical body, you'll be rewarded 100-fold when you are in the spirit world. And this is what I'm trying to bring to you. This is why you need to look at these things. So, because I, I can't motivate you. You have to understand what's happening and motivate yourself. Now, let's get to something more complex. So again, this is from, uh, this is from another book. This is from, uh, this is from Heaven and Below. This is my first book. The Spirit of the Spirit Universe was book two. This is from the first book. And this is a, a group of spirits actually building a building, right? Constructing a building. So on earth, when a church or temple or any building is built, the process entails creation of a design. Afterwards, a construction company is selected, begins hiring workers and suppliers to provide materials. Assembling the physical structure is accomplished by manual labor. But in heaven... Building a temple is also a collective effort, but is a combination of the force of wills by multiple spirits, right? Remember, faith can move mountains. And also they say that faith is measurable in the spirit world. It's actually measurable. And really what I think it is, it's the ability to focus your mind on an object and, and transmit the power of your mind to that object or universal fluid to build an object. So the spirit Kathleen in the book, Life Beyond the Veil, in the Ministry of Heaven section, told the Reverend Z. Valon how a temple was built on the fifth sphere of heaven above the earth. And that's what I tell you. When I number these things from G. Valon, they say anybody can, other people have different numbering systems and different levels, and they just use this one to 10 uh, to be consistent among the different spirits talking to G. Valon. So this is what she said. This, she described the differences in the process in the spirit realm. And this is from the spirit Kathleen. The material is of various colors and of various density. It is not put together in bricks nor blocks as of stone on earth, but grows of a piece in one together. When we had settled on the design of it, we went to the place already chosen where it should stand. That place with a plateau between the lower and higher lands, a sphere five. So first they got together, they thought about it, everything. We assembled, therefore, and after a silence by way of harmonizing our personalities into one endeavor, we concentrated our minds creatively on the foundation and gradually and very slowly raised the stream of our willpower from the ground upward and higher until we came to the dome-like roof. And there we stayed while the angel Lord, the leader of us, gathered the whole of our energies into his own and gently rounded off our endeavors by diverting the willpower stream into space while we begin to stay the current pulsing from ourselves, each one. So let's explain what they meant by that. A tight group of spirits, all with the same objective, used their minds, their collective thoughts, to fashion a foundation and walls out of thin air. It's not, it's really universal fluid. So therefore, there's not really such an object as thin air, for air is not thin nor nothing, but is composed of universal fluid, as is everything else in the spirit realm and in our physical universe. 
That small coterie of spirits conjuring the material to assemble the temple wasn't created by an act of God. They were trained first by the civilizing process of reincarnation, that what we are going through now, whereby they lived multiple lives learning to follow the golden rule in the harsh atmosphere of earth. Next, after they've attained the desire to follow the path of light and love, they were trained in successive levels of heaven. While the team graduated from the universities of heaven on different levels or different universities on different levels, their leader an angel lord, as they called him, possessed of even higher learning and experience, supplied the supervision and the finishing touches to the group's collective effort. So Kathleen now says more. Now, this may sound strange in your mind, friend, but the reason of it was this. We as a company are well trained and for long have exercised to act in concord. Nevertheless, in the finishing of the first stage of that fragile structure, it is needed that a, a far more powerful personality control the forces we set in operation or the building would have been marred in shape or wrecked in structure and our efforts would have been for naught. Further re reason, we find it hard to come at, so as you should be able to understand our words, may have been thinking on the matter, you'll be able to see the reason, the reason of it, if not the method. Think it out on the lines of severing of the cord umbilical and also the other cord vital at death, or the too sudden shutting of the conduit by a sluice gate, or somewhat of a like nature, then you may glimmer what we fain would tell but for the lack of words to tell it. So really what happened then, which is explained, is the angel Lord finished the withdrawal of universal fluid from the spirit universe, and he closed the package, right? It's, it's like, you know, you're pouring concrete, and you just can't pour concrete forever. Sometimes you got to shut, shut that off and stop the concrete from being poured. So he set everything in place by ordering the material that made up the foundation and the walls of the temple to remain in the configuration created by the team. He released it from its last form and gave it new purpose. Hence, from that time on, until a new angel lord may come and command the structure to decompose, the material would stand, never to, de to, to deteriorate for eons to come. Now, this is another aspect of the spirit world. There is no time, there's no decay. When someone cuts a flower and puts it in a vase, the flower stays the way it is. Now, it ha since it knows it's cut, it has a certain life. And after, I don't know, you know, a certain time frame, although there's no time, it fades away. It doesn't decay. It doesn't rot. It fades away and it's gone from the vase. So think of that. So think of what that means. Think of how much power the spirits have to create a temple. And I'll carry on more about this. But think of what that means of how we need to be trained here on Earth to watch our mind, right? Can we can we get angry at our other team members and say, "Oh, I hate you," as they're building as they're building this temple? And do they gossip about each other and they have little clicks? Would that work when you're creating a building with your mind? I don't think so. This is why we go through the tough things we go through here on earth. Now, let's continue on. So they built the foundation and the outer structure. Now, the spirit Kathleen goes on to detail how they finished the inside. So I'll quote. So the first stage with the outer building in completeness, but faint in outline and of transient duration. So resting a space, we set once again to our task and starting at the foundation as a four, we strengthened each pillar and gate and tower and turn as we ascended slowly until the dome again was reached. This we did many times and then left the structure standing, the outer shell alone, but still completed in form. What was lacking was, in principle, depth of coloring, rounding off of the finer ornamentation, and when this should be done, then the solidifying of the whole until it should be so strong as to endure many ages. We went for a long time and off as our forces were renewed to the process, and most delightful and blissful was the work of beauty. 
For the temple was of such majesty, both of proportion and size, and also, also in design, a thing of much beauty ever growing more beautiful, as we gave each of our own to its generation. Buildings are not ever thus raised in the spheres. There are many methods of their erection, but when they are so made, they become not so much the work of builders as our children must be loved, because they be of our own vitality and our own idealizing. Such building as these are also more responsive to the aspiration of those who come after as workers within them, for they have a certain life, not perhaps completely conscious life, but most certainly they are endowed with sensation. I think we might put the matter thus, that while such a house as this shall last, its function is to us, its creators, as the human body is to the spirit who uses it, both walking, waking, and sleeping, we are always in touch with the work there and proceeding through its sensitiveness. And in whatsoever spheres at any future time, the company who created it be dispersed, they always have in that building a focus real and vivid, and the joy of it all is only such as you will know when you attain to creatorship in these spheres, if that be your line of ascent in the kingdom of God. So there's a lot there. Let's talk about this. In most people's life, they have experienced a connection with a certain home or a place they have lived. Usually a childhood home or a relative's house, a secret hideaway, or a place of extreme beauty. They have an emotional connection, which lasts until they leave this earth. Imagine your favorite creation or place. Now think of having a lifelong tie, wherein you feel the delight and satisfaction of each person who comes into contact with it. Wherever you are, that emotional pipeline extends. This tells us that all is connected in the spirit world. The supreme intelligence fashion an invisible web of instantaneous information flowing from all corners of the universe. Universes, I should say. Any small bit of information which our unique identification had any association with flows to us at some intuitive level. It is the same in the physical world, only that we lack the ability to process the waves of data flooding our mind. Now, the edifice was completed, but now it's, it's required the inside to be dressed to fit the building. Kathleen tells us what happens next. I quote, Now, when the outer part was done and confirmed, there remained the work of greater detail within the fashioning of the chambers, halls, and shrines, the setting of the pillars and colonnades, the water of the fountains to bring forth in perpetual flow, and many other matters of detail. First, we stood without and concentrated on the supporting pillars and walls of partition. And when these were placed, we went within and viewed our handiwork, as you would say, but our hands did not much and our heads and hearts were the builders. So what is she saying? Like an office building, which could be organized internally, according to the tenant, the temple was thus formed. After the group had completed the last detail, their leader, the angel Lord, came down from his level. He congratulated the group and fixed some small details, showing them how they could improve their work in the future. Then he left the group to return with another, a higher angel. So now they're going to, Kathleen describes how they sanctified the temple. This is what she says. And there came a day when all was ready, and he returned with another, a mighty lord, whose status was of sublimity higher than his own, and whose powers were what would in Israel be called those of Aaron, and of them who followed him, and by the Greeks, Hierophant, and by the Christians, Archpriest. The process he came to enact was what you would name sanctif sanctification. So the angel, what she's telling us, the angel came to concentrate the temple, was there to link the spiritually important building to those in the higher spheres who are responsible for its protection. So a normal building people would make in one of the levels of heaven wouldn't need to go through this, but this building was going to be linked to higher, higher levels. So it would be, it would, they had to increase the power of that building to communicate with higher planes of those people who were in it. Kathleen told the Reverend Jibao Owen, the same actually occurs on earth. Every place of worship is sanctified by the spirit world. No matter what religion, a protector watches over the flock who congregate there and amplifies their power to be able to commune with the spirit world. 
If you walk into any church, temple, or other shrine and stand for a moment, see if you feel the harmony and vibration. Search your feelings to determine if there is indeed a power watching over a sacred building. The spirit realm provides safe places to all of us. They are concerned that we learn to balance our material with our spiritual needs. Discover by meditation or prayer how you can use the energy of the spirit world to help you grow. Now, these buildings are just fantastic. And they are also talking in the books about, about like liquid stone that lights up, right, and, show, as in, and glows. And in fact, in certain people's NDEs, I know one, uh, a person went to like a city and she saw this wall and the wall had glowing stones all around it. And so it was just like glass with light through it. But because it wasn't glass, it was like stone. And it's amazing because I've also read where there was, you know, buildings with walls around them that had that had like liquid stone and they would have different colors and different patterns of light. So these are all very receptive to the people around them. There are stories where even, you know, buildings, as you walk near these buildings, they will pick up your, your mood and the buildings may change or your clothes may pick up the mood, kind of reflect back from the building and your clothes may change color. So this, these are just wonderments of the spirit world. These are just absolutely, you know, amazing things. So, so this is important to know that when things are built in the spirit world, it's use the power of your mind. It's the power of, of faith. And this is why it's, it's amazing. So now let's go back even to more of the power of faith. Now remember, Jesus said faith moves mountains. Well, in the book On the Way to the Light by the Spirit Emmanuel, psychograph by um, Chico Xavier, the great Brazilian medium, it was told in the book how the solar system, the planets in the solar system were created. Jesus was part of a group of spirits, very, very high spirits, right? That came together and from the dust clouds of the nebulae, whatever was here before, they you know, formed the planets, Jesus formed the moon, right? All these things, these were done how? By the will of the mind. So faith doesn't just move mountains, it moves huge planets, solar systems. God made the universe. It moves so many things. Now, why are we being told this? Because we can visualize it now. Because those who understand. So think of this. Think of it in this way, how the spirit world works. Pretend you're in, you're playing a video game, right? And you're a character that is, you know, journeying from one area to another. And in the video game, your character says, oh, I want a castle here. And he orders a castle here and a castle is created. Now, and then, the so how does that work? Well, the software behind it knows that you, you commanded the character to say, oh, I want a castle at that location. So then the software said, I will build a castle. That was all done not through any physical thing, but, but on your screen, a castle appears. That was all done through software, through programming. Uh, let me ask, there's a question here. In the spirit world, is there darkness? Are there any day and night? Well, it depends on the level. And so that's, that's I could go on for a, a whole program on that one. So on the lower levels, it's usually pretty dim and dark. And the higher you go, it becomes lighter and lighter. And then as you get in the higher levels of heaven, there is no darkness. Um, the sun doesn't like, you know, go around. On uh, the, the lower levels of heaven, it, the kind of the time is corresponding with the time of like Nosolar, it's corresponding to the time of uh, the cities above Rio de Janeiro. It corresponds to that. But as you go higher and higher, it becomes light all the time. Because first of all, you don't need darkness. You don't need this. You don't need to sleep. So. Let me go on what, what I was saying. So therefore, the, so you're in the middle of a video game and you command that castle be created. That is the programming. You have data 
and there's a database that says what a castle should look like. And if you order, I want castle A, B, or C, the database knows what castle you want because you, you, you hit the button C, and there's a castle C, and a certain shape and form is created. It's all done through logic, right, and data going forth. Well, and then let's talk about distance because even the spirits say it's not really – there's no distance in the spirit world. It's either absent, it's either it's either there or it's absent. So what does he mean by that? It's there or absent. It's all how, how what you're connecting into. It's all how you, you fashion things. So again, let's go back to the video game. Your character now wants to cross the ocean to go to another island, right? Let's say it goes from North America to Europe. Well, then you... Your character gets on a boat and goes to Europe, right? Maybe done in two seconds. Well, the character didn't really travel. He may have appeared to travel. All you did, though, was change logically the space they were in. Change your environment. And in fact, in the book, in my first book, Heaven and Below, they talk about how Jesus, when Jesus came, and after he, you know, from the resurrection, and he, he appeared in, uh, to the disciples, he said, look, Jesus didn't come in the spirit world, like walk down or fly down to the spirit world and say, here I am. No, he, he thought himself, he thought himself to change the environment he was in. And he's in, so therefore he was in that environment appearing to the disciples. And when he left, he thought himself out of that environment. Again, one can understand these concepts, why they weren't brought to anybody earlier, because they're difficult concepts to grasp. And you really have to look at the example of your video games, your cell phone, and understand that logic looks physical, kind of Kind of does physical like things but it's all it's all a construct it's all logical construct and this is why but this is the, the this is the great news of spiritism we we are gifted we are spirits selected by the spirit world who've gone through who knows how many eons in order to become at least good enough people to be into a human form to to become trained to be in that creative process, if that's what we so choose, or other paths. I don't know what the other paths are. They only talk about the creative process path. To so choose to use our mind to create. So it's as if you're in the middle of that video game, and through the use of your mind, you create the lands you want. You appear in whatever land you want to appear, because you have the, your mind is connected to the operating system, and, you know, the applications, the subroutines, however you want to call them, of that game. And therefore, this should give you an idea, you know, because people write me all the time, life is horrible on earth. I don't want to reincarnate anymore. And I was thinking, hey, you know, I don't blame you. Who wants to go through this? But what's waiting for you is that you are this conjurer, Right? Conjuring, you're, you're, you're creating something out of nothing. Not really, that's universal flu, but you're creating something with your mind. So do you understand now how much training and responsibility one has and one must have before you are given this, you know, license to even unleash your thoughts, being, you know, this, this explains. Now, this is why it's so interesting. So let's carry on and see what else Alan Kardec has. I, wanted, I really went off a tangent, but I think it's important to expose, uh, you know, what is, you know, what is out there. So let's carry on with what Alan Kardec says. So from the religious point of view of faith, consists of the belief in the special dogmas which constitute the various religions. All of them have their articles of faith. From this aspect, faith may either be blind or rationalized. 
Blind faith examines nothing and accepts without verification both true and falsehood. And at each step, classes with evidence and reason. Okay, so what Alan Kardec is talking about, which is very important here, it's very important to us here on earth, is spiritism does not want blind faith. If you're going to have faith, and remember, faith is measurable in the spirit world, you need to have it with certainty. So we carry on what he's saying. So taken to the extreme, it produces fanaticism, right? And you see this not only just with religion, you see this with political systems. People get, fun, you know, you know, being other fanatics. They put people in concentration camps because they don't believe the way they believe. They must be evil, right? That's not the way to be. So, and of course, sooner or later, it all collapses. Only faith that is based on truth guarantees the future because it has nothing to fear from the progress of enlightenment seeing that what is true in obscurity is also true in light. Each religion claims to have possession of the exclusive truth, but for some to, to proclaim blind faith on a point of beliefs is to confess themselves impotent to demonstrate that they are right. So again, Alan Kardec is telling us, no, we have to have a rational foundation. And so how do you have a rational foundation of faith? Well, you have it by your own experiences and your own beliefs. And some people say, well, I don't, I, you know, I, I it's got to be proven to me. You know, it, you know, it, and it's, why doesn't God come and say we're here or whatever? You know, I don't have faith in anything. Well, actually, that's not true. Because every morning people, they, people have faith in a lot of things. And they have faith in a lot of things because they have built it over time. Let me give you an example. In the morning, you go to work. You get in your car and you go on the roads, you go across the freeways, you across the bridges, and you arrive at work. Very simple. But to do that, to arrive at your destination without loading your car full, full of construction equipment, survival equipment, you have faith because you've seen it before. And if you went to a new route, you've seen other roads in that area before. You have faith that the roads work the bridges aren't down and people obey the traffic laws. They're not trying to kill you as you're trying to get to work. So that's faith. And then here's a good mark from someone who's coming in the video it says, we are the tailor of our destiny. So we have to, we have to have faith. And like Vanessa Anzalone says, think the good, feel the good and seek the good. That's a good part of having the faith is getting yourself in the mindset of that. But then again, but so that's a very important part of, of studying and understanding spiritualism. Get yourself into that mindset of, of again, Buddhism says that, right? Is, you know, you, you act and you feel in a way and it becomes the way. And, and Buddhism is so, you know, has a lot of, been very advanced as far as reincarnation and that information. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, a lot to follow there. But the other thing in faith is your own experiences. Did you have any strange experiences that you could not explain? And that, you know, when, when you see ghost stories, you think, well, I kind of saw something once, but I didn't know what it was. And other people, all debunk it's people's imagination. You say, no, it wasn't my imagination. So those are things in your mind, right, to capture on or someone you knew or you had a near-death experience that changes everyone, right? Um, they say, oh, yeah, there's the spirit world, and I, I've been reincarnated, right? There's, like, no uncertainty in those people's minds. I always say, when people at NDE, it's like taking out a class, went to the vice principal, said, no, nah, you need to study harder. Get back in there and, and study, right? So, anyway. But these things happen, right? I remember a friend of mine, when I was talking, I said, you know, I, you know, I believe in spiritism. And I wasn't sure, Right. It, did, you know, do you think I was crazy and that, you know, God, here's Brian believes in spirits? He goes, yeah, no, our family does too. I go, why? He goes, well, my father was in the army. He was, in the, he was one of the Poles that escaped out of Poland, went to England and joined the Polish regiment in World War II. And... He would have dreams the night before they'd go in the combat. They would go on patrol to different areas. And in his dreams, they would, they would be told, okay, 
In this area, there's a German ambush. In that area, there's another German ambush. So he would lead a patrol and say, okay, no, there's a German ambush there. And sure enough, there was always Germans there waiting. Of course, the, the soldiers went around and got those guys, right? And so everyone in his platoon knew this guy knew what was going on. Now, he lived through the war. Then he said, when he was, just before he was mustered out, right, at the end of World War II, he had this dream of this house with like a white picket fence. And, of course, you know, he got out, and then, you know, he didn't want to go to Poland because, well, first of all, i get off track for a second. First of all, his friends that went back to Poland, I was now under communist rule, they all died of heart attacks, right? And these are soldiers in their 20s now, maybe, you know, late 20s, dying of heart attacks. No, the communists wanted them killed, again, because of the fanaticism. They didn't want people who, who knew about freedom and democracy to go back to Poland and infect the other people there. So anyway, he stayed in England, of course, then eventually moved, uh, immigrated to the United States. But when in England, he met his wife and, you know, he was allotted a, a house. There was the exact house he saw with the fence. So, of course, my friend said, yeah, I, I know there's something there. I know there's something that, you know, we can't see and we don't know. So that you never, so everyone has their own, their own reason to believe. Some people feel, some people hear voices, some people just know because they're born in that, you know, higher state of, of knowledge. So that's, you know, that's why it's important that your faith has a firm foundation, right, in your mind. And that you know that when, you know, the internet tells you or TV programs tell you that anyone who believes in a superior power or knows that there is a set of divine laws that you cannot change, right? Wrong is wrong, I'm sorry. And they try to tell, no, no, everything's relative. No, it's not. You know, relative morality is just one of my hot buttons. I, I, it's so destructive. And you know, for, for the media and those that to tell us that there is no right and wrong in this world is incorrect and misguided. And I don't mean the right and wrong where people are prejudiced against each other. No, those the, those things are not they're, they're not correct. Yeah, Spiritism tells us we we should love everyone. It doesn't mean we don't put people in prison, right? If they do things wrong, but wrong things that go against our conscience, we know, right? You don't murder, you don't slander, you don't you don't you don't hurt other people, you don't lie about other people, etc. Right? Things that you will know in your mind because all of us have a set of divine laws in our conscience. And we know when we've done something wrong. And therefore, and again, as Alan Kardec said, when you have faith, you can withstand these, these people telling you that, nah, you're mistaken. You don't know what you're talking about. When you're dead, you're just dead. No, when you, when you get out of this physical shell, you go back to the spirit world and you, you are who you are when you died. Same personality and character. You might be a little bit smarter and more beautiful or handsome, right? Because you're going to start looking as you think you should look, but you are, your personality is the same. That's why on earth, now, on earth we are given a chance to mold our character and our personality. And why are we here to have to go through all this hassle, right? Because on earth we feel the emotions. It's like 10 times stronger than, you know, if you're in a level of heaven and you want to improve, and you're surrounded by love and by friends all the time, how much emotional turmoil are you going to have to change some little areas you want to change? And I'm not talking about people in the lower zone that have big areas to change. I'm talking about little modifications. You're not going to do it because you're too comfortable. So you come to earth, and you have to go through these little lessons and trials and tribulations because this, the spirit world will supply the stimuli you need even though you don't know what you did in your previous life, it doesn't make a difference. They know what stimuli you need to change your character and your personality. Now, for those who are reincarnated from the lower zone of the dark abyss, they will go through much harsher trials and they will have some pretty big primitive emotions and urges taken from them by some very harsh trials. That's, you know, that's 
the way it works. But there's a reason for this. The reason is that we are being trained and guided towards something so immensely powerful where we have the power of gods. You know, what ancient men in you know, pagan mythology thought gods could do, that is what high spirits can do. So that's what I want to leave with you tonight. Anyway, I want to say God bless all of you. And please, again, if you want to find out inf more information, you can go to my book, in, book one, Heaven Below, and then a lot about spirits and what are their attributes and how they are trained and how they are educated is in my book, Spirit and the Spirit Universe, book two of Spiritism. It is on paperback, Kindle, and audiobook right now. So you can get it in three different ways. So again, I want to, you know, please subscribe, share this video. I want to say everyone have a wonderful uh, week coming up. I will be back next Sunday. And on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Eastern time, I'm now live streaming on my YouTube channel. And so again, that's another one where I do a live stream. And so if you'd like to see that, Fine. If not, I have lots of YouTube on YouTube and BitChute and BitTube. I have over 200 videos. They're, you know, they're pretty timeless. So if you're interested about spiritism, wander through them. Like on my on my blog site, NW Spiritism, I have articles. I kind of put those down. Wander through them. I have different books, and you know, I kind of try to explain each book. So go through and and explore. You know, motivate yourself. What's going on? Anyway, I want to thank everyone and say, everyone, God bless and good night. God bless.